All righty, good morning. Uh, welcome to today's presentation on viscosity, ILM 310-303F. Uh, second last ILM in the chemistry section. So we're getting close to the end of the tunnel here. Today's objectives describe absolute and kinematic viscosity, which is a bit of a review for us. We've looked at this in a different subject already. Uh, we will talk a little bit about Newtonian and non-Newtonian liquids, which is also, I believe, a little bit of review of something we've addressed earlier. And the last objective, describing the effect of viscosity on flow measurement. So that's probably the only new objective that we have today and a pretty key element of flow. So let's get right at her here, starting out with uh, a little bit of definitions. Viscosity. So what is a fluid? Uh, something to clear up now. Fluids uh, are really, by definition, anything that flows, whether it be a liquid or gas, uh, that'll flow when force is applied to it. That force can be simple, just like gravity, or it can be mechanical in terms of pumped uh, flow. Um, we've all observed different fluids that had different flowing characteristics, such as water or oil or molasses. So we have some firsthand personal experience with different types of viscosity. Viscosity, by definition, is the resistance to flow. The slower a fluid flows, the higher its viscosity. And again, we probably all had some experience with different types of viscosity. So low viscosity flows quite easily. Medium viscosity, not quite as much. And a high viscosity is going to flow a lot slower. Um, this provides us with some background uh, information, I guess, on the challenges when we're moving fluids through pipelines and things like that. Um, the amount of energy required to make uh, something move in a pipeline is tied directly to its viscosity and the amount of effort that it takes. When we look at process measurement and control, and particularly flow measurement, we have to make sure that we understand these effects of viscosity. Some of the concepts that we're going to come and address today are going, in, going to include absolute and kinematic viscosity, which we have discussed previously again, uh, which is similar to volumetric flow compared to mass flow, uh, where we introduce the density variable into that equation. Uh, we talk about Newtonian and non-Newtonian liquids, uh, words that are used to describe the characteristics of different fluids when force is applied to them. Um, we get into laminar and turbulent flow, which we haven't talked about yet, um, but is pretty common in our industry, especially when we're talking about uh, flow. You're, you definitely hear the terms uh, laminar and, and turbulent and Reynolds number and things like that. Uh, and then we talk about some of the general properties of fluids. So we know uh, just through life experience the properties of uh, most liquids. Um, we'll compare the properties of liquids to those of gases. So one difference in the behavior of a fluid is due to the nature of its chemical bonds. A stronger bond creates resistance to breakage. Um, and it's this breakage that contributes to uh, viscosity, higher viscosity. Um, fluids have greater strength in their bonds and they're thus harder to break apart. Molecule size is another factor that affects flowing characteristics. Uh, longer molecules, longer chained molecules uh, have a tendency to tangle uh, and get stuck together. Uh, and that represents viscosity and as such they will also flow uh, more slowly. In the context of this course, uh, we're mostly concerned about with how viscosity affects our measuring equipment or the effects it has on flow measuring devices. It's important to consider viscosity when we're selecting the device for a specific application. Additionally, um, we'll look at some of the industrial applications that use viscosity, um, typically for quality control purposes and these are industries like oil and gas, uh, as well as the food and beverage industry uh, and uh, different applications that viscosity plays a role in. So readdressing absolute and kinematic viscosity, we've talked about before. Again, absolute viscosity is a measured resistance to movement that a body has in a fluid. So this is absolute or dynamic viscosity. It was defined earlier as uh, having to have force involved 
uh, in its measurement somehow. Kinematic viscosity was the measurement of a flow uh, of a fluid through a restriction, and we look at uh, we looked at the capillary viscometer and how gravity uh, affected the flow uh, of a fluid through that measuring device as it uh, ran through the restriction, and we timed we timed its flow. So those are the two types of viscosity that we've talked about earlier, and we talk about again today. Absolute or dynamic viscosity, again, is a measured resistance to flow when force is applied to a fluid. Again, that's the key point there. An easy example of this is to imagine washing your hands. Uh, we know that water has a low viscosity at room temperatures, and when we put our hands under the tap, we can easily rub them together, and that's the force that we're applying. Uh, if we were to do the same thing with something that's thicker, like molasses, uh, we would notice that it is, of course, much harder uh, and slower as we move our hands back and forth or apply that same force. That is directly related to viscosity. So we see that the velocity that we can move and the force that it takes to make that move is a, ref is a reflection of the viscosity uh, and the friction that is in between the two moving surfaces or the stationary surface um, relative to the moving surface. So we'll talk about the force that's applied and the amount of uh, stress that's created uh, with different fluids and their viscosities. So absolute viscosity, again, relying on that force. So absolute vis viscosity is proportional to the force and velocity ratio. So that's a pretty fancy math statement there. Uh, it's represented by the symbol eta, or this fancy little n in the calculations. And basically, uh, we've discussed this already. Uh, we have force and time over area, representing the, what's going on over here in the plates, the amount of force, uh, the time that it takes is related to velocity and the area of the surfaces. Um, that unit comes out as uh, newtons uh, per meter squared, and then we can convert that into uh, common units such as the poise or the centipoise. Most common fluids are generally between 0.5 centipoise and 1,000 centipoise, and, and the typical unit that you're going to see most often is probably uh, the centipoise. Measurement instruments uh, for measuring uh, absolute or dynamic viscosity, we use the rotational viscometer. So remember that in order to measure absolute viscosity, we need to have force and movement. So in this case, the rotational viscometer has a spindle that rotates in the fluid, and the torque that is required to keep that spindle turning is proportional to the viscosity of that fluid. That wraps up our little refresher course on absolute or dynamic viscosity and leads us into the second type of viscosity, which was kinematic viscosity. Uh, kinematic viscosity is the ratio of dynamic viscosity to density of the fluid, if you recall that from previous lecture. Uh, it's measured with special capillary tubes. I think we call these Ostwald, Ostwalds uh, in a different section there, and relates to the time it takes for that fluid to flow out. So we fill a particular volume chamber with the fluid uh, and we allow that to drain through this restriction and we measure the amount of time. That amount of time times the tube constant that comes as part and parcel with the piece of equipment is uh, what we end up with as a measurement for kinematic viscosity. Uh, the kinematic viscosity is represented by the letter nu, or this little v in the calculations, and its measurement unit that we typically use is the stoke, or the centistoke. So centipoise, uh, poise, and stoke and centistoke are the units that we're mostly concerned about. So we talked about the relationship between absolute and kinematic viscosity. Uh, when we measure both of them, it is shown that the kinematic viscosity is a ratio of the dynamic viscosity and the fluid's density. Again, this is reviewing. The kinematic viscosity is the ratio of the absolute viscosity over the density of the fluid. The absolute viscosity in newtons per meter squared and the density in kilograms per, per meter cubed. We did some exercises in a previous lesson where we did some of the math to convert from stokes to uh, from meter squared or meter squared to stokes and back and forth. Um, this slide kind of reviews um, that calculation. Um, and it tells us that we ultimately get all this information from Newton and the Newton 
and how we get from our measurement of Stokes. So the, the Newton ends up coming up in that meter squared per second unit that we saw earlier. And we then convert it to Stokes. And to convert from uh, this meter second, uh, meter squared per second uh, into Stokes, we multiply by 10 to the 4. And to get sent to Stokes, we multiply by 10 to the negative 6. So density and absolute velocity, uh, viscosity, sorry, rely also on temperature. Viscosity in general relies a lot on temperature, and we've also ex had some life experience with that, uh, living in Canada, where we know that uh, engine oil in the summer uh, flows a lot easier than engine oil in the winter, for example. So most of this stuff we can relate to pretty, pretty easily. Um, but when we are doing viscosity measurements, it's of course important that we measure at consistent temperatures when we're doing these calculations. Okay, here's a quick math example. Um, again, this is, I believe, very similar to what we looked at uh, in a different subject earlier. Um, calculate the kinematic viscosity of gasoline in centistokes at 15.6 degrees, given the following conditions. The absolute viscosity of gasoline at that temperature is 3.1 times 10 to the negative 4 newtons per meter squared. The density of gasoline at that temperature is 680 kilograms per meter squared. So the math here is not complicated at all. Again, just dropping it into the formula. So the viscosity on top by the density on the bottom gives us a number of 0 0.000045544.55 or 4 times 10 to the negative 7 meters squared per second. That's the first part of our calculation. And then to give it, uh, to get it to Stokes, we would multiply by 10 to the 4. And then if we wanted to get it to Centa Stokes, we would multiply it by 10 to the 6. So uh, the example in the ILM uh, does it in two steps, first measuring it by 10 to the 4, which gives us a new number of 0 0.00455 Stokes. And then they ask you to multiply it by 100 again to get Centa Stokes, which would give us the answer of 0 0.455 Centa Stokes. Or we could take our original number and just multiply it by the 10 to the 6 that we saw here, and we would get straight into centistokes. So that's, I think, just about the only math in this ILM. So again, not uh, ter terribly, terribly complicated in terms of anything uh, new. So we talked about temperature and its effect on viscosity. And I think from experience, most of us know that as a liquid gets warmer, it generally is going to flow more easily. Uh, this is due to the fact that as a fluid heats up, the molecules have a tendency to move farther apart, making it easier for objects to move through them. And it also happens to bring more energy in there and gives them more uh, potential to break their bonds. The most common test temperatures uh, are 40 degrees and 100 degrees Celsius. And this here is just a quick little chart that shows us um, how increasing the temperature reduces the viscosity. So viscosity goes up on this scale, uh, temperature goes up on this scale, and you'll see with all of the examples here that the uh, warmer it gets, the lower the viscosity of a given fluid is. So heavy, here we have some 30 weight motor oil, for example. So on a cold winter day, our uh, viscosity in semipodes is way up here in the tens, uh, 10,000 or in the thousands way up here and on a hot hot day it's down here in the tens so significant effect uh, temperature plays in viscosity next up is something called a viscosity index um, something that's probably new to most of us we might have heard of some of these things before uh, you might not have but a viscosity index is a scale that indicates that change in viscosity of lubricating oils over a temperature range. So that's this graph over here is kind of that viscosity index graph. High viscosities correspond to a small decrease in viscosity as the temperature increases, and low viscosity corresponds to a large decrease in viscosity as temperature increases. So um, some fluids change dramatically with temperature, some not so dramatically with temperature. Uh, the best oils have high viscosity indexes, meaning that they don't change a whole bunch throughout a relatively broad temperature range. So here we have a high viscosity index oil you see holding together. Uh, if these were both at the same temperature, let's say 60 degrees or whatever, 
uh, a high viscosity index oil would hold together a lot better than a low viscosity index oil. That leads us into something a little bit more uh, relatable, which is the SAE oil grade. Um, we've all heard of things like 10W30 or 20W50 or whatever happens to go in our vehicles. Um, what do these numbers mean? The Society of Automotive Engineers, SAE, created a grading system to identify motor oils according to their viscosities. The higher the number, the higher the viscosity. So uh, 10W30 uh, is thicker than 5W20, for example. Um, the W that you see in this uh, code here stands for winter oil. Uh, and that's kind of interesting because we have standard straight grade oils such as SAE 10, which is a single grade oil. However, by uh, we also have what's called uh, winter graded oils or multi graded oils. And in this case, uh, SAE 10W30 is called a multi grade oil. And what that means is uh, it will behave differently at different temperatures. In the summer, when it's average 20 degrees Celsius, it acts thicker. And in the winter, when it's minus 20 degrees Celsius, it acts thinner. So it's pretty interesting how, how they can do that with the same fluid. The way they get it, the way they can do that is through something called viscosity improvers. So turning a single grade oil into a multi-grade oil, they add these improvers, uh, which are polymers that react to the temperature change. As the temperature goes up, the, the viscosity will actually increase. Um, in a nutshell, the way it works is that when they're cold, and you can probably relate to this, when they are cold, uh, the molecules coil up and they're easier to move around. Uh, but as they get warmer, they tend to uncoil and then they more or less tangle up as they flow. And this impedes, impedes the flow, increasing uh, the viscosity of the fluid. I keep saying velocity instead of viscosity here. So there you go, SAE oil and viscosity improvers. How did they do it? It's magic. Gas viscosity. Uh, real quick little blurb here on gas viscosity. Uh, not much mentioned in the ILM about it at all. Gases are quite different than liquids. Uh, as they heat up, their viscosity actually increases uh, due to the molecules getting more active and crashing into each other, causing more resistance and therefore higher viscosity. So really all you need to know is that gases behave the opposite of liquids when it comes to uh, temperature. Next up, we have our wonderful friend, Mr. Newton, and we're going to talk about Newtonian and non-Newtonian fluids. And this is one of my more fun lectures when we're in the classroom because I get to make a little science experiment, but we don't really get to do that today. Um, so let's just do the theory part here. So Newton's third law of emotion for every male action, there is a female overreaction. Not really related to this course, but comedy is always good. All right, so let's talk about Newton and fluid behavior. So this Newtonian concept deals with how a liquid's viscosity is affected when force is applied to it. And it's not something that we really normally think about it. We apply force to a liquid and it, and it squirts out or whatever. We don't really think too much about it. Um, but in terms of Newton, Newtonian liquids do not change their viscosity when force is applied to them. And this is what we think of with most liquids. Non-Newtonian liquids, however, will have a change in viscosity when force is applied. And there's a few liquids that we can relate to that have this uh, quality. So Newtonian liquids, uh, ones we're most commonly familiar with, would include things like water, air, uh, some oils, uh, most, most liquids. Um, Non-Newtonian liquids, are things like oobleck, which we'll talk about later, but common examples are ketchup and gravy. Um, you know, they're, they get thicker um, when we apply force to them. Oobleck is a mixture of water and cornstarch. And if you get a chance after this lecture, perhaps, to get on the old YouTube machine there, uh, just type in oobleck and see what happens. And it's kind of neat uh, when you approach oobleck in a container with a, a spoon or something like that. Slowly, uh, 
the, the area you drop the spoon into the oobleck, it'll slowly creep its way down to the bottom. Um, but if you slowly take that spoon back out and you try to force it in there rapidly, it actually uh, increases its viscosity so much that you can't push the spoon into it. So that's really the concept that we're talking about here between Newtonian and non-Newtonian. It's the reaction that they have when force is applied to them. So that force uh, starts to relate into a, a couple of things physics uh, related here, and that's uh, we're going to talk about uh, shear stress and shear rate uh, here a little bit, and that's the amount of uh, effort required to make something uh, move. <clears throat> so shear stress is applied parallel to the liquid surface. It is measured uh, in units of force per unit area. Uh, in a nutshell, it is the amount of force divided by the contract. Uh, contact area. So the formula for shear stress is simply force over area in newtons per square meter. So we, we've talked about this a little bit before here, and there's a little bit of math that's coming up uh, with this as well. Um, but we're going to take the measured amount of force per unit area uh, and do some calculations. The second variable, and we're talking about uh, viscosity, is the shear rate. And the shear rate has to do uh, with the change in velocity of the levels or the uh, layers of a fluid inside of a pipe and how fast uh, it moves. So the shear rate is related to the change in layer velocity. So if we have a stationary plate and we have a moving plate here and we have some kind of liquid in between it, the theory behind it uh, says that um, every one of these layers is basically sliding off of the other layer and there's more friction closer to the stationary plate or more friction on the side than there is in the middle. So we get a, a different shear rate kind of for every one of these layers. Um, but when we talk about the fully developed flow, we consider shear, re shear rate to be an average of the rate of all these different uh, layers. So if we apply force onto this, and we want to move it and we get a certain amount of speed, we can use those measurements in order to determine viscosity. And that's where we're going with all of this wonderful stuff here. So that shear rate, again, is the change in the layer of viscosity or ve velocity, finally had a chance to use velocity and I didn't. Change in layer velocity over the liquid thickness that we have in here uh, measured as L. The shear rate units are in meters per second per meter, which converts into this fancy little unit. Uh, S to the negative one. So we'll be using this unit for a shear rate unit in a calculation in a second. Okay, here we go. Newton for figs. So this is uh, something related to us, a little bit of math for us. So Newton figured out uh, that there is a relationship between the absolute viscosity uh, and shear stress to shear rate. So the formula that he figured out is that absolute viscosity can be calculated by dividing the shear stress by the shear rate. Again, the formula for shear stress is force over area. The formula for shear rate is velocity over distance between the plates. And this gets reduced again down to force over area, or in the case of the math that we're going to do, we extrapolate this force area over VL. Uh, we flip this one around so that we can uh, do the calculation and get an answer out in uh, newtons per meter squared. So the formula applied to a question, as we see here in the ILM. Calculate the shear stress in newtons per meter squared, causing a shear rate of two, uh, I'm not even that I'm sure what the unit is here, seconds uh, in gasoline and SAA E30 weight motor oil at 15.6 degrees. The viscosity of gasoline is this number and of the oil is this number. So all we're going to do is be taking um, our numbers and plumping them uh, down into the formula here. So in this case, we're going to find out the shear stress, which is force over area. and plunking in the, the numbers from our calculations here. So given 3.1 times 10 to the negative 4 for the viscosity and 2.0 s to the negative 1 for the rate, we multiply them together and we get this for gasoline and this for the oil. 
So again, no tricky, complicated math for us to worry about. We can then take this number if we wish and convert it to so, uh, Stokes or Centis Stokes as we did earlier. Okay, Newtonian liquids. Um, so most liquids that we're talking about again uh, that we have experienced are Newtonian and they have a linear relationship between the shear stress and shear rate. That is a low viscosity fluid such as water will require less shear stress to create the same shear rate as a higher viscosity liquid. That sounds confusing, but again, it's just like rubbing your hands together with water and rubbing your hands together with molasses. One of them you're going to be able to move much faster with much less force than the other. <clears throat> this can be put into context um, by thinking about how big of a pump, which is a shear stress creator, it would take to move water and if that same pump would be capable of pumping something like molasses. So in industrial terms, it makes a difference in the amount of energy that it takes to move uh, a fluid through a pipeline, for example. So here's what Newtonians look like. They're nice and linear. Um, it, there's nothing uh, unusual or strange about this. Um, this is very common for us uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. Newtonian, uh, non-Newtonian, sorry, fluids, however, are quite different. They have a non-linear relationship between shear stress and shear rate. Um, when we think of ketchup, uh, if we just hold it upside down, um, trying to get it to go onto our fries, it has a low amount of shear stress. We're not actually moving it, so it's going to take a long time for that to flow. It has a low shear rate. But if we shake it, we create higher shear stress, and it comes out much faster, which is a higher shear rate. So you can see here our nonlinear relationship, low stress, low rate, high stress, high rate. So that is uh, quite the opposite of Newtonian fluids. This leads us into something finally that is a little bit more relatable to us, and that is viscosity and its relationship with flow. Newton's theory of viscosity assumes that liquid flows in these layers, as we talked about here, and we talked about a velocity profile being an average uh, of the shear rate of all these layers moving uh, against each other, and that the viscosity is the friction between these layers. So ultimately, this is kind of what's happening, and when we talk about flow, we talk about flow like this. So we, this is an average representation of what's going on here. So how does viscosity relate to flow? Well, viscosity t dictates what our flow characteristics are going to be. The characteristics of whether the molecules are held together and actually flow in these laminar layers, or if these layers break apart and become what we know as turbulent. So we're going to hear several terms that relate to these flowing characteristics of a process. And these terms, as I just said, are laminar, turbulent, and transitional. These are the terms that we use to describe what's going on inside that pipe, um, taking into consideration um, the, the fluid properties, uh, particularly viscosity. So laminar flow from the Latin word laminae, which means thin plates, very similar to plywood, which is laminated together in thin layers. And when we have laminar flow, as we see in this diagram, we have no mixing between the layers. All the layers are held together uh, by their bonds in a nice, uh, even flow. Laminar flow occurs when the liquid flows in layers, as we saw earlier. These layers are slowest moving near the pipe walls, increasing to a maximum velocity uh, at the center of the pipe. So here we have more friction on the sides, less friction in the middle here, and it creates this curve that we call the velocity profile. The average velocity is calculated by dividing the volumetric flow rate by the cross-sectional area of the pipe. And we've done that calculation elsewhere as well. So opposite of laminar is turbulent. So if we increase the velocity of that medium flowing through the pipe, at some point that laminar flow profile is going to break down and become turbulent. Turbulent is turbulence is a result of these layers separating. So here we have a nice laminar flow with our velocity profile coming through. Here we come into this restriction 
which increases the velocity quite a bit and in the process breaks up that laminar flow into turbulent flow. And again, when we're measuring flow, we generally are looking for a nicely developed flow profile as opposed to a turbulent flow, uh, which would require us to uh, add extra equipment in there in order to straighten it out so that our flow measuring devices can measure accurately and consistently. The time at which laminar flow breaks down is due to the viscosity of the fluid and some other factors. Uh, the viscous force holding those laminar layers together is subject to being overcome due to three main things that we talked about. Uh, first one is distance and or diameter, which is related to the differential velocity between the walls in the center of the pipe. And that will increase as pipe diameters do, making the layers less stable. So smaller pipes, will tend to hold the flow together better than larger pipes will. Velocity, second factor, the faster something flows, the harder it is for those molecules to hold, to hold together. So generally speaking, as we increase velocity, we increase the potential for uh, laminar flow to break down into turbulent flow. The third thing is density. Increasing density increases the force on the layers, kind of like g-forces and holds them together. Uh, so thinner fluids will break apart easier than thicker fluids. This brings us into Reynolds number. So that Reynolds number you've heard before probably is the number that we use to predict or designate whether or not a flow is considered to be laminar or turbulent. It takes into account all of the factors that create turbulence and the fluid's viscous force to give us a guideline as to how a flow will behave. We use the formula here for Reynolds number. The Reynolds number, of course, here takes into effect, uh, into effect the, the three considerations that we were talking about. So D being the pipe diameter, B being the velocity, uh, rho being the density, and viscosity here, which is, I believe, mu. So given these variables, which we've discussed in this slide here, we can assign a Reynolds number to it, which we can then use to predict whether uh, we call something laminar or turbulent or transitional. So <clears throat> takes into account all those factors, and here are the guidelines uh, in terms of how we name something. So a Reynolds number less than 2,000 predicts laminar flow. A Reynolds number between two and 4,000 is called transitional. It will have characteristics of laminar and turbulent flow. And a Reynolds number greater than 4,000 predicts fully turbulent flow. Usually at this point in the classroom lecture, some student will say, hey, we've seen different numbers in a different subject related to laminar and turbulent. Uh, don't worry. Uh, don't worry about the fact that the numbers are different. Uh, any questions related to Reynolds numbers uh, will fall within the criteria as they are defined in the two subjects. So here's transitional flow kind of out of order here. We said that transitional flow has a mix of both the laminar components here and the turbulent characteristics. Generally, it's smooth near the pipe walls and more turbulent in the center. We would be remiss if we didn't have a calculation for Reynolds number. So just to prepare you for anything that you may see in the future, uh, calculate the Reynolds number, uh, Reynolds number for a Newtonian fluid with an absolute viscosity of 0.38 Newton seconds per meter squared and a specific gravity of 0.91 that flows through a 25 millimeter pipe with a velocity of 2.6 meters per second predict the type of flow. So we want to know, is it laminar, is it transitional, or is it turbulent? So not much that you need to do here uh, except to plunk it in the formula. So you're going to want to convert your density from a decimal number into a cubic meter uh, kilogram number here. So 910 comes from 0.91. You're going to want to convert the diameter uh, of your pipe from millimeters into meters, so 25 millimeters is 0 0.025 meters and this is where most of the mistakes happen and then substitute the values into the equation so our diameter 0 
our velocity of 2.6, our density of 910 over our viscosity of 0.38 will give us a calculated number here in this case of 156, which is below 2000, and we will call that laminar. Ta da! That is the end of the viscosity presentation. Have a good day.